I want to begin, um, Professor O'Keefe, if I may, I'll call you Veronica for this. I think we agreed that beforehand. Um, can we just clear up psychiatrist versus psychologist versus psychotherapist, in case anyone's in doubt? What is distinctive about your work as a psychiatrist? Well, if we were American, we'd all just be shrinks. <sighs> Basically, I'm a medic. I have a medical degree. Psychologists study the structure and function of the mind. And really below the neck is foreign territory. In much the same way that above the neck is foreign territory for many medics, apart from neurologists and psychiatrists. So I suppose neurologists and psychiatrists are doctors who focus on the brain and look at brain illnesses primarily. Neurologists, just to clear this up, because I think it's quite confusing sometimes to understand the difference between a neurologist and a psychiatrist. And it's a blurry distinction. Oh. But basically, neurologists uh, look at motor and sensory impairments. In other words, what goes wrong in your body if you have a paralyzed arm after a stroke? And what part of the brain corresponds to that? In other words, what part of the brain you've bled into? And it tries to treat disorders that can be visually seen, like epilepsy, like um, stroke disease, like motor neuron disease. So disorders of the motor system that are apparent. Psychiatry, on the other hand, looks more at cognitive and emotional disturbances. So illnesses that in which people are neurologically intact, we would say. In other words, they can sense things in a normal way. They can move all their limbs. They have normal reflexes. Psychiatry looks at things that are below the surface, really, the more interconnecting parts of the brain, the emotional centers and the integrative centers of the brain. Um, so sometimes disorders cross from neurology to psychiatry and psychiatry to neurology, but mostly from psychiatry to neurology. And this is a point that disturbs me actually, because it, if we find the etiology or the cause of an illness, it frequently gets transferred to neurology. Yes, and but the cause, you mean the organic cause, like a physical thing that you can right. pinpoint. Yeah, that's right. Like for, for centuries, up until quite recently, up until about a century ago, epilepsy and schizophrenia and psychosis would all have been treated as similar disorders. How interesting. But now well, epilepsy has been shifted across to the neurologist because we know what's happening physically in the brain. Is, is that? That's, cool? that's correct. So my argument about psychiatry is we need to grab the brain back. And we need to say that you know, we are now looking for the causes of the emotional disorders in the brain. And I suppose that's very central to my book is experience and saying to people, you want to understand your experience, your experience is just as organic as the way you move your hand. And that's such a striking aspect of the book that you, you have <laughs> both barrels, really, the, 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 the personal biographical uh, accounts of patients' subjective experiences, but you also look at the, the structure of the brain and, and this sort of marrying of the two approaches. Um, it, it seems to be integral to what you do. But I mean, what does that do for, for instance, let's grasp the nettle, um, the, the, the still prevailing stigma around mental disorders compared to physical ones. I mean, if we're saying that they do have organic causes, does, does that help a patient? Um, does, does it help how we understand patients within society. What does that do? Um, I, I think that's a, a hugely important societal question. And it seems to me that psychosis in particular is the last big hurdle that we haven't confronted. I'm gonna to have to and pause you there because psychosis is also one of these terms that a lot of lay people like me, we, we get a bit baffled. We sort of understand 
dimly that it, it means some kind of mental disorder to do with the perception of reality, but, but could you explain what psychosis is? Yeah, thanks for that. Well, psychosis is basically a disease of the brain or a disorder of the brain. It may only be temporary. It could be induced by drugs. It could be induced by um, blood loss even, or by stroke. So psychosis is basically where whatever is happening in the outside world isn't being translated in a real way into your brain. So you're, you're misinterpreting the world and you're forming representations of the world that are false. Mm. So the sort of world that we all share, we all share the same world because our eyes, ears, and our, our sensory functions work and our integrative functions in our brain, the putting together of all that with our memory is working. But some, for some people, those connections are awry. And those connections give them a fake, distorted idea of what's happening in the outside world. So they live in an alternative reality. They hear voices that aren't necessarily been spoken from the outside, but their brain is firing off, producing voices as if there was a voice out there. So it's a terribly confusing disorder. And as you say, a highly stigmatized one. And I mentioned psychosis first. Um, schizophrenia, for example, is a common psychotic disorder. Believe it or not, 1% of the population suffer from schizophrenia. And that's consistent historically. It's, it's not like um, attention deficit disorder, you know, which is blossoming, if you like, in, you know, in the last few decades. Schizophrenia has always been there. It's been there in the biblical prophets, and it's there, it's been throughout the asylums, uh, history of the asylums, and it's there today. And yet, such a common disorder is so rarely spoken about. Mm -hmm. Even the fact that you have to ask me to guide the listeners into what the meaning of the word psychosis is, mm -hmm. is very illuminating. So I, I think what you've asked me to get back to your question is, central to what I want to say in this book. And that is that all human experience is processed in the brain. However mystical, however spiritual, however creative or beautiful uh, that experience might be, it is a consequence of what's happening in the magic of the brain, in that integrative, those integrative centers of the brain of which memory forms the, the deepest really and most personalized and creative component of. So I, I think that if we understand our own experience, nor, you know, normal or abnormal, depending on, um, on what sort of brain you have and what has happened to you throughout your life. Um, if, you want, if, you read a, my, if you read a book and that gives you an insight into your own experience, I think that would give you an insight into abnormal experiences and how they are based in the organic matter of the brain and how we needn't fear them, how we need to understand these people and welcome them into society. And in the same way, I think that we've welcomed people who are atypical in the sense of social intelligence, like the Asperger's and people with autistic disorder, there's been a fantastic opening up societally for those individuals, but that hasn't happened with psychosis. And that is my, my dearest wish, yes. Uh, that removing that, that, that stigma, that, that those um, that obstacles. Um, very interesting to use the word um, abnormal, um, um, because one of the things that struck me most about the book is that of course you look at case studies of, of people with various psychoses, um, schizophrenia and other conditions um, but it seems to me that your object is not just to um, understand those conditions but to see how abnormalities what light they show what light they shed on on the way all of our brains and, and minds work um, have I understood have I understood that right that there is a kind of a, a bigger project at stake here beyond what you might say is psychiatry, but, but actually looking at the very way we, we think and behave and, and remember. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for putting it so well. <laughs> uh, 
basically looking at the abnormal is a very good way of understanding the normal. And I think in terms of experience and brain function, we're very blind, we're blinded to it in a sense because we inhabit our own consciousness. And it's, it's, it's difficult to understand what's happening to us moment to moment, um, unless we're a deeply introspective person or a wonderfully creative writer like Proust or James Joyce or some Virginia Woolf. Um, and of course, those people immerse themselves in their own consciousness and we're able to objectify it in a sense and help us to understand our own experience. And that's one way through. But I think um, understanding or seeing abnormal experience helps us to understand, the, the helps us to break down normal experience because that absence of function that we take for granted can be hugely illuminating. Um, for example, I, I, I cite the case of a woman who lost her memory. And, um, you know, it, it, it was very enlightening for me to see a person who had lost their memory and had lost their sense of self entirely with that loss of memory. And what I noticed particularly about this woman was that she couldn't identify place. So she would be, and I, I tell the story of being in an interview with, room with her, and as the interview progressed, there wasn't a, a softening or a getting to know each other as what usually progresses with, um, with human beings. Because as I'm talking to you, we're getting to know each other. And um, as we get to know each other, obviously the dynamic changes. But that didn't happen with that woman as usually happens over a psychiatric interview, which take place, takes place over something between 40 minutes and an hour, the initial one. And that was peculiar for me. And that was because she didn't have a memory. She wasn't, she wasn't, um, there wasn't a cumulative experience of talking to me building up in her. And the other thing was that I brought her out of the interview room briefly, um, just to the foyer. And when I brought her back into the interview room, she was starting all over again. She hadn't seen me for five seconds and she hadn't seen the room for five seconds and she came back in, she didn't know who I was and she didn't know where the room was. And I felt that this was a woman who was entirely lost. She was lost in the world. And more than that, she was lost in herself. And it was very instructive to me. And I was very young at this point and this was pre-clinical scanning era. It was very instructive to me about how central memory is in the way we communicate with people, in the way we orientate ourselves in the world, in, in simple and in complex ways, and in terms of our own identity. Mm. It, you say how central memory is. I mean, that is the theme that runs right through the book, how all forms of identity and, and, and our sense of self and, and the way we can operate um, rely on this, um, I don't want to call it a master key, but, but it seems that memory um, underpins and sort of links all, all the other functions that, that, I mean, you said that without memory, we, we don't have any identity. And that's a very disturbing thought. If it makes me feel a bit provisional, you know, I'm sort of stitched together by, by this sort of lucky sense of something ongoing. Um, I mean, how common is it to lose that thread? Is this, I mean, is it something that would be a sort of a, a massive um, injury to the brain? It, it, should, I, should I be afraid of this? Uh, well, you certainly no signs, James, let me reassure you. <laughs> My wife may disagree. <laughs> any form of memory loss, um, either uh, short-term, long-term, or memory processing. Um, so... It is very rare. Mm. It, is, it is very rare to have a coup d'etat, as it were, mm. of memory loss the way that tragic woman, young woman did. And she actually had a, a tumor, a, a huge tumor in her brain, in the memory factory in the brain, the hippocampus. So her brain was hit very specifically in, uh, in, in a central 
mechanism for memory formation. But she did still have some memory hmm. because she was able to walk, she was able to cook, she was able to drive her car. So th there, there are two types of memory. There is a memory that's ongoing and which we're forming from moment to moment. And as we're talking to each other, we're processing memory. So I'm processing what I've heard a few moments ago from you and you're processing what you're hearing from me. So that's memory is an ongoing thing. It's very live. It's what we're using that this woman couldn't use. Mm. She couldn't have a conversation that had a thread um, because every moment was a new moment, mm. essentially. But there is the memory that goes up to the outer parts of our brain. Memory like learning to ride a bicycle learning to drive a car. And all these motor functions are automatic. So there are certain things that even if you lose parts of your memory, you will retain other parts because the memory becomes, as it were, automatic. It goes up from your memory centers, from the hippocampus at the center of your brain, back up to the outside of your brain, and it's automatic there. So you will be able to automatically remember some things without having to actively recall or without having to process your memory from moment to moment. To, to, ask, to answer the question about um, how comrie memory loss, gentle memory loss is a part of the aging process. I'm feeling but, that already. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a baby. <laughs> um, you can say that at my age. No, the, 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 the thing about it, though, is it's not all bad, because as you get older, the higher parts of your brain um, contain more and more integrative memory. So the outer parts of your brain uh, become more knotted together. So the, the memory becomes denser there. And that's really what abstract memory is. It's the automatic processing of information. So that's something that might be fascinating to a child, you will automatically process. I see. Like a far away thing being small, a close thing being big. Mm. It's the same object. You know it's a small object. Children have to learn that, but you're automatically processing it in your visuospatial memory. So mm. everything that you that we think of as being automatic is learned memory. And as you get older, your, your abstract memory becomes better, not just in terms of visuospatial, but in terms of concepts. So basically you, you become more abstract and more conceptual as you age. And older people are better at teasing out abstract ideas and taking shortcuts. Um, so we may not be as good at processing information as young people like you, but we have the edge in terms of being able to cut through rubbish and um, abstract abstraction we're good at uh, that's gloriously reassuring um, because of course the, the narrative is always of <clears throat> decline and anxiety around memory loss is, is so common in a world where we we know uh dementia is in store for for so many of us so, um but, but what i really <clears throat> really wanted to ask you about um you talk about the operation of memory there and, and it's sort of moving in the brain in a way that is extraordinary to me. Um, in the book, you talk particularly about the links between emotion and memory. And um, I, I wondered if you could untease that a little bit, because some of your case studies um, do have a, tell us extraordinary things about, about the, the way um, it, it, emotions help us reconstitute memory is have I got that right that that that, that there is a sort of an emotional tag um that goes with I'm out of my depth here but I, I would love to try and understand this a little bit better and um, you you're you're exactly right James the the old idea that cognition and memory are separate um experiences is is it you know should be dead we shouldn't really talk about cognition versus emotion because they're connected together. And that structure I spoke about, the memory factory, the hippocampus, knitted very densely onto this is a structure, um, a rounded structure. 
called the amygdala. And the amygdala makes emotions. So what you have essentially at the very center of the brain is a memory factory and an emotional spark plug. And they are densely interwoven. In other words, the neurons actually connect up like a, like a stitch, like knitting a stitch. So, and they grow, neurons grow, they're alive. So when I see something, the energy that comes in through my visual fields, travels and nerves that go back to my cortex and that, that nerve, nervous energy, literally, um, grows connections in my brain. So it's, memory is a process of growing connections between neurons, of patterns forming that represent the outside world. And part of that pattern recognition is emotion. Mm -hmm. Emotion is so central to memory. If you take a very primitive example, a rat, for example, um, a, a rat uh, has a very highly developed sense of, of smell. And the sense of smell is directly connected with the amygdala center. So if a rat gets a smell that indicates that a predator is nearby, um, it'll light up an emotion immediately of terror and fear. And that emotion of terror and fear goes into the brain and makes the rat run away. So here you've got uh, an example of how an extra a sensation is directly tied with an emotion and that emotion is tagged onto a memory and then that memory tells the rat what to do. So emotion and memory are very highly connected and the more emotionally charged a memory is, the more likely it is to light up. So it's the emotional events in our lives that we remember with the most clarity because emotion essentially is a form of energy. It's, it's, a, it's a lighting up, the emotional center lights up the memory. Hmm. Does that mean then that when our experiences in the moment are more emotionally intense, that we in a sense record memories in higher definition, if I can use a visual metaphor? Yeah, are we, are we sort of, tagging them with with significance for, for for future purposes then even as we process experience um we we are kind of allotting it a sort of uh, a color coding of, of emotional significance yes absolutely um psychologists have a term that they call salience and salience really is the attention that an object gets from us. So something that's salient to me may not be salient to you. There are certain um, smells, I'm sure, for you, or certain flowers or certain trees or certain experiences um, near your home in South London that will light up your brain. Other things light up my brain because we have separate memories. But essentially, a, a, an object or a place that is associated um, with an emotion, that, that emotion is emotion and it is salience. It is the electricity that is generated in your brain by that sensory object. So you're absolutely correct. Uh, the, the converse would be, that if you're having a very intense emotional experience and you're in a certain place, that that place can be tagged. And I give an example in the book of a, a woman called uh, Edith who had a postpartum psychosis. After her giving birth, yes. That's correct, yeah. So a postpartum psychosis occurs in about one in 200 live, live births. And it's, it's a terribly um, traumatizing condition because the woman in 50% of cases have no history of psychiatric disorder. And in one to two days post-birth, they're absolutely psychotic. They have no connection with the world. They hardly know they've had a baby. They may see the baby even as 
being potentially evil. They may have olfactory hallucinations. They may smell strange things from the baby and so on and so forth. But in this particular case, um, Edith was seen by her local doctor and was brought in to us for treatment. At the time I worked in the Bethlehem Royal Hospital in South London. And Edith had spotted a graveyard on her way to the hospital. And the graveyard was a very, there was a very old, small tilted gravestone in the graveyard, presumably tilted because it was so old and the soil had shifted. And Edith immediately knew she made a, what we call a perceptual delusion that her baby was buried there because she didn't believe the baby belonged to her. She believed that the baby had been taken from her, stolen from her and um, buried there. And that the baby that was in the house with her, in fact, was an imposter baby, like a changeling. Gosh. Yeah, so she came to hospital and thankfully she got better, but when she passed the graveyard again, what happened to her was she got her, her, when she saw the graveyard, when she saw the gravestone rather, the tilted gravestone, she got an immediate rush of the experience, all of the emotional experience of what she had been like when she was psychotic. She had a reliving of that because what had happened was the gravestone had ignited the emotional center in her brain and that had set off a flurry of memories in her brain that were so strong. It was like an experience of reliving. And in a sense, it's like a flashback. A flashback is an intensely relived memory. But I think Edith really taught me then that memory was very much a live event and that the emotion that a memory carried was so important to how we experience the world. Even if you're looking at an object like a small tilted gravestone, if that has been perceived at a moment of intense um, experience, well, that can make a, a very lasting impression on your brain. And in fact, Edith said something very resonant with me that has stayed with me every se ever since. When, when I was explaining to her as psychiatrists and clinicians do that, she would obviously understand that the tilted graveyard was memory and, you know, that that hadn't really happened. She said to me, yes, but the memory is real. So that really taught me that that memory is knitted into our neural tissue, tissue in our brain as, as you said, as an emotion, mm. as an experience. Mm. And that as we go through life, we're, we're re-experiencing our past all the time through mm. our memory. It is our filter, essentially, for understanding the world at a conceptual and at an emotional level. That, of all the moments in the book, that, that wowed me, that, 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 that for her, it, it, it was real. It, and what I want to ask you about, about that particular case, actually, because I find it hard to imagine, is that having recovered um, to some degree from her postpartum psychosis, she was able to understand and acknowledge that the memory was false, that, that, that this, this was not a true perception of reality. And yet, at the same time, it felt like a real memory. It, is that holding two competing versions of reality? How, how, did, how did she handle that? How, how do you compute? Or, or is this something we do all the time? That, that we, we're constantly kind of negotiating alternative um, interpretations of the reality around us. I, I find it baffling. Uh, it's, it's a huge mystery. And that's why I think that they're fantastic people, people who are able to negotiate a psychosis in the world of common shared reality. Mm. I mean, you and I are very lucky. We're not being distracted by voices from people we can't see. We're able to communicate with each other without distraction. 
Um, but people who have, have psychosis have this constant battle of, you know, there are things going on around them. There is this other thing. Their brain is telling them there's somebody talking there, but there isn't. So they actually have to, in a sense, compartmentalize the voices. They get they they develop an understanding of what the voices, the themes the voices will talk about, the sort of voices that talk at them. They're not talking to them even. They might be having a conversation about them. But they somehow or other, with you know, specialized forms of therapy, and sometimes on their own, sometimes with the help of parents or um, loved ones, friends, they develop mechanisms extraordinarily to, to kind of sift through these competing realities, as you've said, and you know, try and focus in the common shared reality and, and live a life, a shared life of uh, commonly shared uh, reality with other human beings, but it's hugely difficult. And for Edith, this was her first time to be psychotic. And she had no idea of coping with this alternative uh, reality that had happened. So for her, there was no alternative. That was what was happening. It was impossible for her to have insight mm. into those experiences because she'd never had to filter out reality in that way. Mm. So, but she began to learn it as she recovered. But I think it, it was because it was such a new process to her that she was able to say to me, well, yes, I know it didn't happen, but yet the memory is real. It's in my brain. What I experienced again upon seeing it was a real whole body, whole brain experience. And she would then, as time went by, she was able to dissociate the memory from the reality. But, you know, these things linger at some level. I'm sure she's, when she passes that graveyard and sees that small tilted gravestone, she will get a, a shadow always of that memory and of that experience. But it won't dominate her. It'll mm. be a few steps removed. Mm. I wonder if the nearest the nearest those of us who've never experienced a psychosis can get to understanding what it might be like um, to experience a reality that is projected onto the mind from within rather than from without um, would be how we deal with dreams. Um, because here is, for many of us, a completely absurd, chaotic, nonsensical, and yet has many of the feelings of 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 reality um you know the, uh, and has a deep emotional sort of washes um and, and, and in fact recently i had a, myself i don't want to turn this into my, my 40 to what i run a <laughs> psychiatric <laughs> interview but um i recently um woke in the in the middle of the night i think from a nightmare um and i was confused for a time as to whether what i'd been dreaming about um, I, I thought I'd perpetrated a horrendous crime as a small child. Um, I was confused for a while as to whether this was a memory that I'd suddenly, you know, re rediscovered in some traumatic way, or, or whether it was just a nightmare. And it took me a few days to feel absolutely sure that this wasn't this was just something I confabulated in the night. But it, it was deeply, obviously, very disconcerting experience. And I wondered if dreams. You know, how do they pertain to memory? Um, you know, why don't we, why are we usually able to distinguish dreams from reality so well? How do we know that they're not part of our, our normal experience? I mean, we, we do normally know. Is it just because they're so odd? It, it, it's, it's a very, very broad question. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of physiology, sleep is central to memory absolutely central to memory because what happens during the day is our our little uh, hippocampal cells are weaving memories all the time so they weave and they weave and they weave there are only so many hippocampal cells we have right and they can't we can't keep reweaving all the time because then the memory just gets obliterated by 
something else. So what happens during sleep is that these memories go, what I call go cortical. They go from the hippocampus back up to the cortex. And in that process though, and this is where nightmares and um, other things happen. In the process, as they're weaving their way up through the patterns of memory, sometimes what happens to us during a day will trigger something, something that's old, latent, forgotten in our memory. And it'll wake us up because there's, there's a realization from the undertow of our memory that's telling us, look, there's a warning here. Something has happened to you today. There's a memory that's coming up here now. And I'm giving you advance warning that this is disrupting something. And the thing that it's, disrupt, that it's disrupting is related to what happened to you during the day. So in terms of what your dream was, what I would say to you is don't think back to your childhood. Think about what happened to you that day and in the preceding days. And then, cause, and then work uh, backwards because your brain is, is warning you about something. And essentially, if we had no memory, well, we wouldn't have that unconscious warning signal to us to think and to think about something for a few days is a very good way of trying to understand what the dream means. Mm. And of course, the more spectacularly salient and the more arresting a dream is, the more we remember it yes. and the more we think about it. So dreaming serves a very clever function in, in terms of our past telling us in a sense about our future. And I think that's probably why people say, well, dreams foretell the future, because the dreams will warn you. They're there to warn you about what might happen. So if I get um, a night terror and I, I'm very focused on it, I write it down, I think about it. I think like, why did I have this dream at this particular moment? Am I in a situation like I was in before and I'm not aware of it. I was blind to it then, you know, maybe I shouldn't be blind to it now because it's happened previously. So thinking about what's happening to you currently is, is a very good idea. It's, it's very interesting because the, there is a spectre hovering over this bit of the conversation and the spectre is called Sigmund Freud, it seems to me. Um, <laughs> you, you, you're not nice about Sigmund Freud in the book at all. Um, and, and yet, is there some, you know, however disproved, however misguided, was, was, was he at least right that, that dreams are a, um, a signal to us to pay attention to our biography? Is there anything left of Freud? Would, would, you, would you throw away the whole thing? Uh, Freud is part of our collective memory. Um, just like, I mean, if, if we think about uh, particle physics, uh, if we think about the speed of life, we all think about Einstein. Mm. But of course, there were fantastic physicists around. They weren't rock stars like Einstein. I mean, he had a fantastic turn of phrase. He was a hugely gifted man, a really gifted communicator. But there were people around him like Minkowski, who was just as clever but he wasn't a rock star. So, but Einstein is in our collective consciousness in the same way that Freud is. I have a problem with Freud because he knew that girls were being abused. He knew that there was in, incest, was very common in Victorian times. He tried to out it. And then he realized that if he outed it, basically what would happen, is that he would lose his position as a famous person. And, you know, he was an ambitious man. He made a choice. So he backpedaled. And so instead of saying men, fathers, uncles were abusing girls, what he said was the girls created fantasies about the men abusing them. 
and created the whole thing about penis envy and so on and so forth. So I have a problem with Freud for that reason. And uh, I don't have a problem with Einstein. So Einstein remains, even though I know he's not, even though I know he's not the beginning and the end of particle physics, he, re he remains as that person. But I think Freud for me is quite malignant. Mm. And the, the other issue is uh, the, the, of Freud's legacy is he has said that everything has a cause. And I think again, you know, he, before that psychiatrists or alienists as they were called, would have said that psychotic disorders and severe melancholia came from a disease of the mind, of the brain. Whereas Freud said, no, everything was curable. It was connected to some disturbance, infantile disturbance, you know, old that it were, old that we could go back and fix everything. But, but we can't, we can't fix everything. Some people have brain diseases like psychosis, like severe depression, like severe OCD, and they're not fixable by going back to childhood. So I suppose those two main reasons are the reasons that I have problems with Freud. In terms of the unconscious, Freud, Freud, Freud didn't formulate those ideas. Mm. William James, uh, mm. William James was, was, was the man who gave us the phrase, the stream of unconsciousness. Mm. And, you know, his, his brother, Henry James, was the novelist who, you know, wrote some of the first streams of consciousness novels. Mm. And, uh, you know, William was his psychologist brother. And, um, uh, you know, he... he outlined sorry i'm going to have to just turn my phone off here excuse me yeah um absolutely um, sorry um yeah so so you know freud wasn't the original of the species and i'm much fonder of the way william james writes and so for me he's really he's really the hero that has um you know, that has peaked into what lies beneath and given us a, a, a beautifully eloquent version of it. Freud is quite tedious to read as well. <laughs> to hear. And, and, and it, also what you say brings us back to um, the idea, which is so central to, to, to what you say, that, that the, the, you know, our memories, our, our reality is anchored in the brain as an organic piece of matter full of energy. Um, Whereas, you know, Freud does seem to take us further and further away from that in looking always in the biography. Um, and I find that very encouraging, not least in terms of, I mean, you talked about what is fixable. Um, and, and, and you say, you know, sometimes things can't be fixed. But do, do you, as, as a psychiatrist who, who sees um, the brain and the organic as, as so central, um, you know, does this mean that we will increasingly find um, interventions, um, whether chemical treatments or surgical or uh, who knows, electrical, um, th that some of the um, disorders that we have understood as psychological um, will eventually um, be, um, be, be become curable because we will understand their, their, their etiology better. Is there hope? Absolutely. There is there's fantastic hope. I think perhaps people don't appreciate how much psychiatric disorder is treatable. Uh, you know, in clinical practice, 70% of depression uh, responds to antidepressants. Um, and now we have newer therapies. I mean, I think most psychiatrists would have an inkling of the sort of depression that responds to antidepressants. Um, and then there is the sort of depression that might be actually more related to deeply embedded patterns of behavior rather than to, you know, a faulty genetic protein producing the wrong sort of serotonin receptor. We can kind of cure those with serotonin receptor reuptake inhibitors, but they, they sort of faulty developmental uh, you know, bad parenting, toxic 
childhood. Um, we're beginning to see now that maybe there's a place there for more experiential therapies. And there's a lot of research going on now into psych psychedelic, mm. the use of psychedelics in terms of inducing new experiences in consciousness and opening up people's minds to new ways of understanding the world. Because even if you are pulled out of a rut, a uh, reverberating circuit of experiencing the world in a very negating way, even if you're pulled out of that for a period of an hour, that is that is essentially a neural pathway that is growing in your brain. You've opened up some neurons in your brain. And for some people, they can reuse those neural pathways. And so they have... They, provide new ways of perceiving the world and of experiencing the world, new ways of seeing. So there are, you know, I, I'm quite hopeful about experiential therapies for, for people who are in those kind of, what we might call internalizing disorders. Um, I think for psychosis, we have a long way to go. And psychosis is, 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 is really, it's, it's really, the part of psychiatry where that is the most complicated, where all of our experiences are integrated. And that's going to be multiple different proteins, different genes, a whole range of environmental insults as well that are coming together. It's going to be very complex and there isn't going to be one thing that causes it, but there will be key proteins. And when we find those proteins, I think that is the beginning of the destigmatization. You bring somebody in and you say to them, look, there's something wrong with this protein in your brain. Uh, you know, we can fix this. And, you know, immediately they're not mad, they're not crazy. Mm. They see themselves as having a faulty brain in some way. Mm -hmm. And other people see them that way. So I think people with severe and enduring mental illnesses are very eager to understand the chemical, pharmacological, organic network, you know, wiring problem that is in their brain. It could be something like um, a mitochondria in a certain type of cell in the brain that's causing the disorder. There's, you know, there's a billion possibilities, literally. The flip side of um, finding cures, if I can put it like that, is um, it seems to me that any um, intervention, especially medication or, or drug, um, immediately lends itself to um, off-label uses to uh, and abuses. And um, is this um, a prospect in the future that we should be worried about, that as... Um, we discover more and more psychoactive um, drug treatments that they will be used for um, as accelerants, as stimulants, as um, yeah. and then all the questions come about who has access and, and what are the legal limits. I mean, you talk in the book very interestingly about um, a patient with bipolar disorder um, uh, and having a period of sort of hyper consciousness. Of being sort of, me, sort of a brain that's sort of working at a at a, a more. I mean, isn't that something that we're going to want? Is that a danger? Very a very provo provoking question. I, I think what's happening with psychedelic, just starting with abusive compounds. Yeah, there there is a huge potential for abuse with psychedelic compounds. But the, the alternative to that is a lot of people don't want to take psychedelics. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in taking psychedelics. I, I think I'd like to, but it's not something I'm hugely interested in. Um, you know, I don't feel the need. Um, I have a, a lot of internal stimulation, if you like. Uh, yeah. You know, if you have a rich interior world, maybe, you know, you, you don't want them necessarily. And I think, uh, you know, some people don't give themselves the time to develop an interior world. 
but they're not readers like you, James. It's not their job. They might be doing other things that, you know, uh, that are far more prosaic. And, um, you know, there's a whole culture of microdosing. I think it's, it's a kind of a, a way of um, connecting with the world, um, you know, for people, for example, who, you know, who live in Silicon Valley, who, who don't have a lot of time for introspection and maybe people who are attracted to that sort of work are not particularly introspective sort of people. And maybe they have, uh, you know, more of a need for that kind of transcendent um, experience than others would have. Mm. So I think, you know, the sort of person that you are and the sort of way you are in the world will determine whether or not you want to mm. um, take these substances. But for something, for example, that's already there and has been tested, like um, the uh, stimulants that are used to treat ADHD, my view would be that they are being abused. And they are being abused in a sense, I think, there is a collusion between the med medical practice and ambitious parents. And, uh, you know, the, the, the mushrooming of diagnosis of ADHD is, I find it really alarming. And, you know- My child is not performing as I would have hoped. Therefore, there must be uh, medication required, but actually maybe the child just isn't, you know, as you would, as the parent had hoped and, and should be allowed to be not as the parent had hoped. Is, is, that, is that what you're saying in a sense? That's exactly what I'm saying is that these drugs are being used for enhancing cognition as cognitive enhancers see. rather than being used to treat uh, disorder. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can pathologize everything, yeah. um, you know, you, essentially you can, but I think what we've got to tr try and do is normalize ourselves and you know work at our own pathology recognize our devils recognize our our everybody is slowful in some way everybody is anxious in some way you know we're all lazy about communication in some way so we all have to address these problems rather than pathologizing them and you know some people are less academic than others and you know why uh, I was struck by uh, a story that my one of my PhD students told me, and she was from Boston. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about this and she was saying, Veronica, I don't know what world you're living in, but 50% of the people, she was a postgraduate student, 50% of the people in took cognitive enhancers uh, for their final exams. And she felt, in fact, 50% of people admitted to it, that you were at a disadvantage if you didn't take them. So I, I do feel that there is an industry mm. and we need to be very careful about industries like that. And we need to accept diversity mm. and we need to work on ourselves. Mm. Yeah. So there is a danger with um, experiential drugs, I, and we should guard against that. But I think I think I don't think we're very good at doing it mm. in um, with psychoactive compounds as yet. Yeah, um, I don't want to anticipate a question. I suspect you're going to be answered when we open go to questions, which we, we will do imminently. Um, <clears throat> but you mentioned smell and the centrality of smell and how intimately linked it is with with memory um and i just wanted to i'm so curious about it myself i wanted to ask you a little bit more about it and you, you talked in the book about an experience you had with the smell of a particular herb um lovage i think um, mm -hmm. and i wondered if you could just t tell us about that because for me it did illustrate sort of perfectly how your book brings in your own experience, your clinical experience, your, your understanding of, of, of the neurology of the brain. Um, what happened to you? Well, I, I was pregnant in Cambridge and I had a herb garden at the back of the house. Um, I was in the first trimester of pregnancy, the first three months, and I was very ill and 
prone to nausea, particularly every morning I had nausea. Um, but uh, I was also learning about herbs. I was doing a lot of gardening that summer. It was a glorious summer. And one evening I had made a salad and I got particularly sick and I was very sick the following day. And I knew it was something in the salad, which is in itself interesting. Because if you think about your own experiences, and if you've ever had food poisoning, you know what it is. No. <laughs> so that process is your brain retains a memory for a smell. And so your brain has already associated the food with the smell. You don't even know how it's happened, but it has happened. So somehow or other, there was something in that salad that I knew had made me sick. And a few days later, I was out in my herb garden and I suddenly had a feeling of nausea and I smelt the smell and I knew immediately that that was the substance that had made me sick before I even saw it. I, my brain immediately said to me, without my understanding what had happened, that smell is the smell that has made you sick. And I turned around and there was a plant called Lovage, which is a gloriously big green, dark green, glossy plant with yellow flowers. And I had been reading up about herbs and quite interested in medicinal use of herbs, so on. But oh, that's strange, that made me sick because I knew nothing about it. Anyway, I looked it up in my book and I found out that Lovage was actually an abortifacient, um, if used in very large quantities. And I was absolutely fascinated by this because somehow or other my brain, there was some collective memory in my brain that was might have been telling me, this isn't good for you, mm. you know, keep away from it. But I also had the, the immediate memory that brought me back to the salad I had that day and it allowed me to link to the lovage and tell my brain, don't eat lovage anymore. And the reason was because smell goes directly into the emotional center in the brain. The, the circular structure that I told you is just knotted onto our memory center called the amygdala. So smell runs directly from our nose into it, just a tiny pathway that long. So our smell is going directly into our emotional center and that is going directly into our memory. But we get the emotion mm. before the memory. So I got the smell before I had made, I got the emotion of disgust and of nausea before I got the memory. So mm -hmm. I smelled it and I felt disgust. So it goes into your memory first. So that's why smell is so immediately emotional. Yeah. You know, whatever smell you have, James, from your childhood, there will be some smell. There are, <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I love that story because it seemed to tie together so much. You know, you have this sort of, hinterland of a folk story in the book as well with talking of changelings and lovage and there is this there's literature and um, somehow that encapsulated so much of what i loved about the book and, and the personal as well and <laughs>